Thank you for standing by for the Cigna Preventing and Treating Type 2 Diabetes in Children's Seminar. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Barb Miller. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Barb Miller, and I'm a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator and health educator on the integrated personal health care team here at Cigna. And today I'd like to talk about preventing and treating type 2 diabetes in children. Um, it seems like every day we're seeing in the news more and more comments about the rise in diabetes, and one of the things that we're noticing is that it is happening very frequently now in children um, that we're seeing type 2 diabetes, which was only before recognized in adults. So the objectives of today's conversation is to talk about the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in children, um, talk about some of the risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes, and then the most important part is how to delay or prevent the development of type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is the most common type of diabetes diagnosed in people of all ages. 90 to 95% of people with diabetes are diagnosed with type 2. And when I became a dietitian a very long time ago, um, type 2 diabetes was not something that we saw in children. In fact, it was not even anything that was being recognized. It was not on the radar. Nowadays, we're finding it to be something that's very common. And the real concern about type 2 diabetes in children is that it may develop very gradually over a period of time without a lot of signs and symptoms. And during that period of time when there aren't a lot of signs and symptoms, there can actually be damage happening to these children's organs. So we're very, very interested in um, recognizing diabetes and also in preventing it. So some of the symptoms that can be observed in type 2 diabetes, and this includes people of all ages, either children or adults, is we oftentimes see that there's increased thirst. Um, blood sugars go high, and so people are triggered um, to drink more fluid. And usually that also leads to a lot more urination. So sometimes thirst and increased urinations are, are one of the signs. Also, people may have increased hunger because they're not able to actually use some of those calories that they're taking in for energy. Occasionally, there's weight loss, um, fatigue, blurred vision because the um, eyes actually end up, um, some of the fluid gets pulled out of the eyes, which results in blurred vision. Slow healing of sores or frequent infections. And especially in children, there may be areas of darkened skin, and this can be especially noticeable around the neck area and also the armpits. And so sometimes parents of children will think that their children maybe are not bathing very well because they have these dark areas. And really this is an indication that their blood sugars are starting to run high. More and more nowadays, um, there is better screening guidelines for children, both that are at risk for type 2 diabetes and that also um, just in general screening of all children. So starting at age 10 or really at the onset of puberty, um, they are doing body mass index with children. And this is very different than the body mass index that we use with adults. It's a, it's a different um, chart that's being used. It's actually a percentile. And so they check for children that are about the 85th percentile for age and sex, and, and those children are at much higher risk of developing diabetes. Also, if there's a family history of type 2 diabetes, this puts a child at much increased risk. And specific ethnic groups have very high rates of, of type 2 diabetes in children. Um, these are African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Americans, or Pacific Islanders. And then it's also important to mention that um, a mother's history of having diabetes or having gestational diabetes can also increase a child's risk of developing type 2 diabetes, especially if the mother um, was having uncontrolled blood sugars during the time of pregnancy. So what happens in the development of type 2 diabetes is there's some metabolic defects that are taking place. In our body, we have an organ called the pancreas. Um, that secretes a hormone called insulin. And either sometimes the body isn't making enough insulin or the amount of insulin that it's making is not able to be used because there's actually some resistance to the insulin being used in the body. This can often happen when a person is carrying excess body fat. 
The second thing that's going on is glucose levels start to rise because the insulin isn't enough to move the glucose into the cells to be used for energy. And so this is why some of the symptoms that develop can be a lack of energy. It can be, again, um, a person having a, an increased thirst, increased urination. Um, some of these things are, are happening, and, and this is a result of these metabolic defects that are going on. So the scariest part about diabetes is it really can affect every major organ in the body. And it's important to note that diabetes can be managed. So when a person is diagnosed with diabetes, what we really want to do is we want to prevent this damage from occurring. So that's why early diagnosis is extremely important. Um, damage that can occur from type 2 include the heart and blood vessels, um, eyes, and this is something called retinopathy, kidneys, this is something called nephropathy, nerves, this is something called neuropathy, fatty liver disease can develop, and then skin conditions and infections can occur. Sometimes, in fact, when people are diagnosed with diabetes, it, it can be an infection that actually leads to the diagnosis of diabetes, or it can be that the person maybe has uh, seen their optometrist or ophthalmologist and found that there are some changes in their eyes that are indicating that diabetes may be present. So there are some lab parameters that are used for diagnosis. And one of the, the common ones is a fasting glucose. This is oftentimes used as a screen for different kinds of health fairs. Um, so fasting means a person hasn't had anything to eat um, for many hours. And if they find that the blood glucose is greater than or equal to 126, um, that may be an indication that diabetes is, is going on, or a random plasma glucose, so in other words, non-fasting, of greater than 200. Something that's also being used even more commonly today is something called hemoglobin A1C. This is a measure of average blood sugar over about a two to three month period of time. And a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or greater is now able to be used as a diagnosis um, for diabetes. Um, somewhere between either 5.7 and 6.5 can be an indicator of prediabetes. So sometimes we're able to um, look at the average blood sugar and say, well, they're, they're higher than average, but they're not quite to the level of diabetes. But it's an indicator that maybe there's something that we can do to help get this number down and help prevent um, this from progressing on, at this point, to full-blown diabetes. So for any type of diabetes, especially for, for type 2, um, we want to normalize those blood glucose levels. So we want to get blood sugars down to a normal level. Um, we want to decrease that hemoglobin A1C level. And most importantly of all, we really want to prevent complications. So when a child is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, really um, education is the most important thing that can be done. And it needs to be the child, along with any significant others in the family, they really need to all participate together in what we call diabetes self-management education. Also, it's extremely important to do self-monitoring of the blood sugar, so in other words, testing blood sugars, um, taking medications if needed. Physical activity and meal planning are also extremely important in helping to manage type 2 diabetes. So to go into a little bit more detail about each of those areas, um, blood glucose monitoring, monitoring really is the only way to know how the diabetes is responding to um, either medication, a change in, in diet, or a change in physical activity. And children may be a little bit hesitant about uh, checking blood sugars. The one nice thing that we have going on now is we have much smaller needles that are used for poking fingers, um, so there's much less pain associated with testing. Um, the amount of blood that's necessary for testing is, is generally a very small amount with the meters that are available nowadays. And there are alternative sites that can be used. Um, people can use their palm or their upper or their lower arm um, for testing, although this can be a little bit more difficult um, for obtaining blood, but those areas are available that can also be tested. And then really for children with type 2 diabetes, there are only two medications right now that are approved to be used with children. The first one of these is metformin. 
And this is a medication um, that is generally the first medication also used with adults with type 2 diabetes and is also a medication that's sometimes used with um, people with type 1 in addition to their insulin. The nice thing about metformin is it actually works in a couple of different ways. It helps the body to decrease the amount of sugar that's put out by the liver, and it also helps um, the insulin resistance uh, to be decreased. So in other words, there, it can help decrease uh, insulin resistance. And then the other medication uh, that can be used with children with type 2 diabetes is insulin. Um, certainly, if, if metformin is something that's working, um, that's the first medication that's used. But sometimes, uh, the type 2 diabetes has progressed to, to an area where really insulin is the only thing that's going to help bring down the blood sugars. And then meal planning is extremely important. And it's, it's really important to mention that uh, meal planning nowadays is not talking about a diabetic diet. We used to hear about this a lot years ago. There were special plans that were put together for people. Um, those plans focused on certain numbers of portions of different kinds of foods. Um, for instance, you had to eat you know, one serving of starch, one serving of vegetable, one serving of fruit, one serving of milk. And oftentimes, this didn't fit the kind of diet that most people were eating. So nowadays, diet is very individualized. Um, the focus is truly on healthy eating, something that's good for the entire family. That's why we really want to have the entire family involved. Um, there's a focus on, on choosing lean proteins, um, making sure that there are fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and then low-fat dairy products. And, and we have another seminar that's going to be um, coming up soon. And um, there, there's going to be a focus on talking about healthy eating and, and how it really can help um, all children, but especially children with type 2 diabetes. So now let's talk about prevention, which is really the most important thing that we can do for children um, to decrease this rise in type 2 diabetes. And so prevention really focuses on eating healthier foods. Um, many people have said, well, gee, I can't afford to eat healthy foods. They're too expensive. And the truth is, there are a lot of healthy foods that are actually much less expensive than uh, foods that people think are, are less expensive. So to give an example, um, some of the different kinds of fruits that can be very inexpensive are things like bananas or apples that you would buy in a bag. Um, they end up being quite inexpensive. Um, if we're thinking about different kinds of produce, usually cabbage is quite inexpensive. Um, you know, a lot of other produce people can grow in their own gardens too. So we've got a lot of opportunities to educate people about the, the healthy kinds of foods that are available out there. Turns out you don't have to go to McDonald's to get all of your meals if you want to eat cheap food. So um, as, as tempting as, as some of the you know, dollar menus are at many of the different restaurants, not to pick on McDonald's, um, but many of the, the restaurants will, will choose to uh, focus on a food that's very inexpensive, thinking that people will um, go to their restaurants and, and purchase those foods. And people do because they unfortunately are not um, aware that there are a lot of healthy foods that are actually less expensive. Another example is purchasing a loaf of bread and, and buying some type of protein to make sandwiches doesn't end up being that expensive. The second thing that's really important is making sure that um, kids are getting physical activity. Um, I was reflecting back on my own life when I was growing up, and when, when I was a child, parents literally would push you out the door and tell you to go outside and play, and you'd play outside until it got dark, and then you came back in and, and you maybe had supper together. Nowadays, uh, a lot of children are just not really getting out of the house. We've got a lot of video games, computer games, those kinds of things that are attracting children's attention. Uh, but we really need to get back to focusing on having fun and getting physical activity in their day. Also, losing excess weight, and especially body fat, um, is what's really important. If a person is carrying excess weight but it's muscle, um, we're not as concerned about that, but a lot of times when people are gaining excess weight, it is body fat, and that's what results in the increased insulin resistance. So these children may be making enough insulin, 
but their body's just not able to use it because um, the, the excess body fat is getting in the way. And then very, very important with children to schedule an annual eye exam because this can be sometimes the first way that, that there can be changes that are noticed that can lead to a diagnosis early on and prevent some of the damage from occurring. And again, it's extremely important to involve the whole family in lifestyle changes. Um, it's not okay to single out the child um, and, and say, well, you know, you can't have this food and you can't have this kind of snack, but it's okay for mom and dad to do it and it's okay for the older brother to do it or the older sister to do it or the younger brother or sister to do it because really we want the whole family to start developing a more healthy lifestyle. So that's why, again, the seminar that we have coming up really focuses on the family and um, preventing uh, diabetes, preventing other health conditions from occurring. So some really great references and resources um, to follow up on. One of them is if your child has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, there's a fantastic website put out by the American Diabetes Association. It's very, very simple. It's just www.diabetes.org. All kinds of information on there, not just about type 2 diabetes, but type 1. Um, recipes, um, links to many of the different journals that they've published in the past with um, examples on research studies that are going on. So a, a fantastic, fantastic link. Um, one that I don't have on here is one from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And that, that website is www.eatright.org. This is a fantastic website that um, again, provides really great nutritional information. This is a website that uh, dietitians um, oftentimes will refer to, but also there's links for the public. There's also fun games on there that kids can play related to nutrition, so that's a great website. Um, also, there, there's a, a great article um, on the Mayo Clinic website about type 2 diabetes in children. And then um, if you're interested in finding out about the, the BMI or the body mass index in children, um, there's a link on here for the Centers for Disease Control um, website where you can actually look at these charts for children and, and determine whether your child is fitting into that 85th percentile um, for the body mass index. So it's a great way to kind of look at that. And as I mentioned, it's very, very different um, than the body mass index is for adults. So thinking about um, diabetes in general, it's rising in the general population, not just in individual states. So you know, individual state mandates for changes in, in physical activity, for changes in the kinds of foods that are sold or, or taxed. Um, the, it's not just in the United States, but this is a worldwide increase that we're seeing in diabetes. And um, it's, it's just really important that we understand what's contributing to the rise and how we can prevent diabetes from affecting so many people's lives. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for calling in today to hear about this really important um, topic. And if you have any further questions, um, please certainly uh, let our speakers know when we have our next uh, presentation, and we can certainly develop another seminar at that time. Thank you. And that does conclude today's seminar. Thank you for your participation.